Hello, everybody. Welcome to this joint event between Open Security Summit and uh, British Computer Society. We're really glad to be um, doing this together. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a good session tonight. Um, Dennis will give us a little overview of what we've been doing this week, uh, especially. Then Adam and David will give us an overview of what we want to talk about tonight. And then we will start the discussions right away. Over to you, Dennis. Cool. So, first of all, welcome everybody. And, and just from an Open Security Summit point of view, right? Like, and the idea is that we want to be doing these sessions regularly, which kind of leads to the big summit, which we, we might still be able to do in person and maybe this year. Hopefully, it's in June. So, it's, it's a bit, you know, hopefully by then things will be not as locked down as now. But, but the idea is that. You know, this is a forum for us to come, to talk about these things, to evolve, to have debates, to 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 almost bring the multiple parties together, which I think is always been the idea of the summits and the Open Security Summit. And I think this sort of represents that, right? And we want to do this every month. So if you have ideas for the next uh, months, you know, uh, in December and then January and February, we kind of now got to the rhythm where it's every second week of the month, which kind of works quite nicely. I know. I know my, my security team uh, you know, it's already has a, a bunch of things lined up to show for the next one, but I think you know, even on this one and you know, threat modeling and worldly maps and, and other great topics that we covered before, DevOps, et cetera, you know, please, you know, this, this is kind of for everybody, for the community, the Open Security Summit just provides the, the, the forum for this. So these sessions here that, you know, sparkle, sorry, started by an idea that Adam and something that Adam's been involved in, which is the, the kind of the ramifications of what happened with the Schrems 2 ruling, right? So we're going to go into more detail about what it is. You know, the, the, I would say that the key players, but you know, um, you know, everybody please, you know, you can always chip in, but maybe if we just quickly go around, so just to introduce to everybody and, um, and then Kerry, I'm gonna throw you to the mix because from your contributions yesterday, I think you, you were in your spot, right? So, you know, and Dan Screws and CISO of Glasswall and, and CTO of Glasswall Security Solutions. Um, and, you know, uh, one of the main drivers of Open Security Summit. Uh, David, over to you, quick intro. Hi, thanks, yeah, David Clark. Uh, I've got a background in cybersecurity and uh, data protection for some of the uh, FTSE 250 companies in kind of previous roles. Uh, I also have the, the largest GDPR LinkedIn group on uh, LinkedIn, uh, almost 20,000 members, probably make that in the next couple of weeks. Great, thanks. Right, cool. Adam? Hey, I'm Adam Leon Smith. I'm a fellow of the British Computer Society, CTO of private sector company Dragonfly and a director of a not-for-profit called For Humanity. Cool, James? Yeah, uh, James Bohr, a security or cybersecurity generalist. I do various bits and pieces. Right, and Corey, Carrie, sorry, Carrie, right? Sorry. Yep, Carrie. Uh, so hi, I'm a, I'm a consultant. I do a little bit of data protection um, and uh, cybersecurity as well. My background is in law and also in uh, the technical end of, of cybersecurity related matters. So I tend to be a weird bit of a generalist and a uh, gigantic privacy nerd. And I, I work for a company called uh, Credio. Cool. Yeah. Right, so let me uh, share my, my screen so that I can just quickly walk through what happened yesterday and what we're gonna be looking at it today. So. And, um, and there's, there's kind of two concepts or a couple of concepts that we're almost merging here, which I think is, it's a cool thing, um, which is this idea of security labels. Let me share my screen. Uh, cool. All right, you guys should see uh, my screen that says refresh security labels. You guys can see that? Cool. So yeah, so basically on, on Monday, we went, or Tuesday, sorry, we went through uh, this sort of very quick introduction of why labels are good, how it works, you know, when they save lives. So this is basically just past research that's been happening throughout. And, and this is actually comes from 2002, a great presentation from Jeff Williams and, you know, how it evolved. And again, the idea that you can have labels for software, which is a great idea 
but we haven't, it hasn't seen the light of day. There's also this project that tries to do this at OAS 2014. And there's also the security and privacy labels recently, but again, it has been dismantled, but they did great progress on trying to do labels again for IoT. And, um, and I think one of the big lessons here is that you need to create a system or a way to capture information and label it, uh, which is basically just information design of a gigantic graph, right? Uh, in a way that doesn't depend on others to play, because the reality is that a lot of the key players won't want to dance initially, right? So we need to find a way to make this grow organically. Um, and then, you know, we kind of look at some of the sessions outcomes from the last summit, <clears throat> where we look at security levels for COVID apps. And this was just a cool thing of, you could see multiple levels, consent, um, data retention. So this is for the COVID apps, by the way, but just to give an idea of the kind of things you could measure, right? So you, when you compare two or three or four COVID apps, right? You, you can have this kind of information being, you know, mapped. And then, you know, what we then did yesterday was we kind of look at this scenario that um, um, sort of Adam has mentioned, which is the sort of a, a US based cloud based, you know, SaaS email provider, but this could be HR company, this could be, you know, um, another, you know, a recruitment site, this could be data sharing, you know, wh whatever SaaS you use today is equivalent, but email, you know, has a couple of variations. Um, but the idea is that, you know, they have service in, in EU, GDPR base, some data locally, some data in US, and then the users, and then there's the business, you know, who basically, you know, uh, the users work for, and there's kind of a standard contract that, you know, exists, and then the thread in one of them is the US government or other entities that can have maybe access to it. And we kind of played around with multiple threads, the, the paths, for example, you can allow data to go to the US, what was the way it could work. So for example, the EU declares that data storing in non-encrypted GDPR data address is illegal. It means that suddenly you almost have a denial of service and an availability problem with your own data. You know, we then look at this interesting model, which is, for example, like a, what, what would be a safe way to do this from a thread point of view where if the users and maybe the organization have some keys which are able to decrypt the data and only have access of the user uh, uh, and maybe even the business, but is not stored in any of the servers. So the servers actually store encrypted data. This could be a safe model, right? And then we play around with, you know, is this going to be illegal? Right, if for example, right, if, if we say that you cannot have a US based company, you know, um, holding, you know, uh, providing service to the UK company or EU company, because at the moment, you know, and correct me, uh, maybe who has that data, but there was also a ruling recently in the US that said that US companies' data hosted in the EU, but by a, U a US company, is also, you know, basically, you know, access accessible by. The U.S. company, right? Not and a ruling. It, it was a, a the Cloud Act, the U.S. Cloud Act. So yeah. a bit of legislation. Just clarifying that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Sorry, the legislation. And what does it say? Uh, sorry, it's called the U.S. Cloud Act. It was passed in 2018. No, sorry. What, what does he say? Just more specific, since you actually know what you're talking about. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. So the U.S. Cloud Act just—it's it, it, basically—it uh, says that you know, if you are a U.S. company and you are hosting information, you know, um, that uh, on on a foreign subject, in even if it's in another jurisdiction, if it's in Ireland, for example the US government can compel that information through you know, a court order or a, a, a legal-based process, um, regardless yeah. of, the, of the fact that the information is housed in, in Ireland, for example. So it's a bit of a bypass. And I think um, they also allowed other countries to sign up to it if they wanted to, didn't they? So they could kind of join in. Uh, yeah, although that's sort of similar to what's already been in place. There's something called a MLAD, a mutually, Mutual mm. Legal Assistance Treaty. That's been in place before this. The, the goal of the Cloud Act was to kind of do an end run around that because MLADs, it turns out, are a big pain in the butt to set up. Cool. But that, that opens, of course, the massive kind of worms, right? Because even if today the data is stored in EU, you're now depending on not or, or in a GDPR location, right? Um, you know, it, it all depends on what happens on these other countries, right? which could Absolutely. potentially be yeah. a massive problem, right? And then one question was raised also like, is this legal, right? So if you have a company that, sorry, 
that is complying with GDPR and doing all the right stuff from a GDPR point of view, is it still legal, right? And I, 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 and I think one of the comments yesterday was like, until this gets clarified, like the Cloud Act, right? And, and you might end up having I states this, versus states. This has been clarified in the latest okay. guidance that the US can't be considered adequate, but it's not about mm -hmm. the storage of the data per se. It's yep. about the ability to access it even remotely if it's in the clear. And that right. even if it's encrypted at rest, encrypted at transit, if a US person can access that data who is subject to those laws, then it can't be lawful based on the recommendations that came out on Monday. Or it can't be lawful unless there's additional supplementary measures that are in place or there's some... You but know, the examples of supplementary measures specifically say you can't consider it a supplementary measure if it, if there is no uh, if there is no there's no means of preventing them, or they need to access the data in the clear remotely. So maybe can you can you clarify that what happened on Monday then? You know, and you it's about this scenario here, right? So that's sorry, this is the scenario that we're talking <coughs> about. Well, it isn't. It isn't because the data storage location isn't super relevant. Okay, it's it just part of the picture. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's about whether the data is encrypted and could be accessed by someone who is subject to a law like the Cloud Act or FISA 702, which is specific, specifically called out in, in this guidance. It does give examples of things that could be compliant though. So that's, as I, I think that's what you're getting at with the, the threat models, which yeah. is if the encryption keys are retained in the home country, so to, I, won't, I won't say the UK because then we'll get into the whole debate about Brexit, in the adequate country, if the keys are retained there and it's only encrypted data transiting the inadequate country, then that's fine. It also says um, if the, the cloud service can operate without decrypting the data, and I suspect that's where you were going with the homomorphic encryption yesterday, then that is also acceptable. But if you look, if that means no webmail, right? Webmail would have to go unless there is some kind of, I don't know, client side encryption key that works with some really complicated UI logic that hasn't been invented yet. <laughs> it means no search on Google Mail, I am, unless homomorphic encryption can handle free text search, which I'm not aware that it can at speed yet. Happy to be corrected as I'm not an expert in that field. So I think it's quite clear from the guidance that um, just any situation where the data is in the clear, it's personal data, and it, be, it can be accessed by the US is unlawful. Well, it does. It does seem to also infer that you might be able to use Article Forty Six if it's impossible to do. And what's that? It, yeah, it kind of says you, you you can do it anyway if if it's impossible and you need to do it. Uh, I guess it's designed for emergencies, but I guess there is no option. I thought Article Forty Six was the standard contractual clauses stuff. Yeah, but if you can't enforce any of that and you still need to do it, you've still got to kind of do something rather than nothing. Uh, I'm not entirely sure that's accurate, David. Do you mean Article 49, the derogations? Uh, I might have done, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. where you can jump in with consent, say if you need to get a contract signed Correct. and it's for a case-by-case -case, um, requirement. Um, but it's very much a case by case. They they're gonna they they certainly would come down at a ton of bricks on you if you decide to replace some well, regular well, BAU transfer. Well, um, well, that I think that's to do. I think that's right, and I think then the the problem is most DPAs are running on the same software as we all are, and by the mere fact we're talking to them, they haven't got my con consent to send it to America, and and be part of it. Well, so. It can be another derogation you know article 49 isn't just restricted to consent so it could be a you know in furtherance of a legal contract for example or or for you know other other potential interests of hmm. you know legitimate interest is a is 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 a is a challenge because that has restrictions on the amount and quantity of data and the purpose of that use but but there are other derogations. So it's not fair to say that all US transfers are invalid, but it's a lot of US transfers because a lot of them are relying on standard contractual clauses now. I love having lawyers and information security specialists on the same meeting about this. It, this probably hasn't happened before. But I think, I think going back to the use case, which is any cloud email provider that's popular right now, 
okay? So Google, Microsoft, I don't know who else people use. I can't see how that use case in any way a business could claim a derogation for their business as usual use of, of email, which as we said on Monday, we have gigabytes and gigabytes of personal data, not just managed by the company, but created by employees. Okay, you use this interesting curveball scenario. Let's say in Portugal, and I, I don't know if this is true, but let's just follow the thing. Sapo was a big provider. He, he was one of the Portuguese email providers, right? So that's a Portuguese company at a time who provides a service in Portugal. I think they had their own data centers there. But if that company has now been bought, and I actually know it's part of a bigger group, that the group has shareholders from America. So the, the, the group that owns the company that has the email provider now, for example, let's say is American. Does this apply to that? Possibly, I think. <laughs> Um, I think it depends on the majority shareholding, I think, in kind of similar bits of legislation. Yeah. So, yes. It, yeah, it's, 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 it, I think it circles back as well to processing roles for the particular purpose. Um, because um, if you're the same legal entity, it's stickier than if you're just associated companies. And then you get into well, how you define legal entity for the jurisdiction. But um, whoever's the controller who calls the shots who really dictates the strategic mm. reason why you're processing and the overall high level direction of what, how they want it done. Um, it, they are the people who are going to be um, in the firing line for this. <clears throat> um, as a processor, um, you are not liable for, for this compliance beyond the fact that for GDPR, you cannot lawfully provide as insecure service or abuse data just because it doesn't say you can't in the contract. But, but then what, what is the consequence of this, right? So now we got, we got that ruling and we, you know, this is, this is hitting up. And, and according to Adam, what you said, you know, and I agree with you, just about every email provider not just the top boys, not top, you know, top players, but probably a whole raft of mid-level, right? You know, email providers, the longer tail of email providers that is out there, right? This is going to affect them all, right? Correct. And then what happens- They're not based in on a short list of countries, your EU countries plus another small list of countries. And I think that yeah, example is the most clear. It's about ownership, right? So it's not even based, right? It's about ownership, right? Mm. Well, the, the guidance doesn't specifically talk about the ownership or, or the legal entity and the legal construct around it. It's, it's avoided controllers. that one. It's controllers and processors. It's not ownership mm. necessarily. Well, 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 that's kind of where then FISA 702 comes in because that's extraterritorial from the US perspective. They don't kind of really care about that. If you're a US company, you're a US company. But where do you draw the line between a US company says it can't remotely access the data and says in the contract that they won't, they can't remotely access the data, but you know that the, the legal entity of the data processor is controlled by US persons? What, what's the, the, the guidance doesn't tell you the answer to that yet. Yeah, the, go ahead, sorry. sorry. Sorry, no, I, I was just to say that I've been looking at this, that the concept of establishment in a country, I mean, they, that's still very much a bun fight. Um, the, the extent to which you can say for the purpose of doing my European stuff, I'm based in Europe, like Facebook in Ireland, Amazon in Ireland. Um, how kosher is that? How much are you actually driving the strategic decision making and control for that processing out of that location versus paying lip service to having an office and and people and some stuff but really the, the strings are getting pulled in the states that's the judgment from an, an eu point of view um i don't think there's any such qualms going to go into it from the point of view of american surveillance if you've got a if you've got a headquarters anywhere in the states they're going to think any of your subsidiaries are fair game as far as my reading of the law sense right i think that's i think that's fairly accurate yeah the, and and this is this is a thing that Facebook is perpetually, I know, running up against because when I was there for a bit, uh, this was a thing that they were, they were tackling and constantly going to battle with the Irish Data Protection Commission on, which is, you know, you can say you're established in Ireland, but if you're not making effective decisions in Ireland, it doesn't matter. 
Yeah, and that's, that was going to be my next question. So even if you have a legal entity there, right, which is owns the thing, owns the data, has the contracts, if that legal entity is controlled or owned by a U.S. company, right, there is a path in, right? And in fact, even if they have offices, right, even if they have, you know, even if they can say that the support is done locally, the, the servers are now in, you know, European, you know, uh, GDPR friendly locations, right? If that entity is owned by the U.S. company, then, you know, and now the U.S. company has to comply to the, you know, that, that ruling, right? So that, that law, right? That, that says that, you know, if it's a U.S. company, the data is still within their jurisdiction, then that means they have access, right? Yeah. I think it's yeah. interesting to look at TikTok or what was proposed with TikTok, that in order to protect the data from China, the U.S. was insisting on U.S. ownership and a subsidiary being created with U.S. ownership. And it seems naive to argue that the opposite wouldn't be possible with, with the EU in this situation with companies like Amazon uh, the cloud, Google Cloud, Azure. Was was the so I'm not as familiar with the Chinese uh, data protection laws. I'll, I'll I'll readily admit that. So Sarah, if you're more familiar, I'm totally eager to know. Um, or anyone who's more familiar, I'm eager to know. But uh, but I I don't know if um, like the the U.S. tends to take a very long arm of the law aspect of things. And I think what they were what they were doing was they were looking at it and saying, not only do you have to have this U.S. subsidiary, but you also need to sequester the data. You need to localize the U.S. data so that it is just in the United States, um, not in China or any uh, Hong Kong or wherever it was. So if, I, I think that was also part of the proviso, but I'm not I'm not 100 percent certain and I. Yeah, I'm not sure on that one either. So that, that's not where I haven't looked into that in detail. But that's the reverse, right? So going back to your email solution. So is the solution for, you know, the mail providers to start to have local companies who own the data, who maintain the data in, um, in whatever the main areas, you know, that they operate, US, South America, EU, well, or you know, GDPR friendly businesses, right? Against our countries. And then and have what? St strong contracts to say that we, we won't abide to that? Or, or have an ownership model that doesn't kind of allow that type of, of request? Right. So the contract aspect, at least, was addressed in the recent. Um, uh, the recent guidance issued by the you know European Data Protection Board, and they said that you know in addition to doing these other steps, you know, try to identify areas where the contract can be changed. So this is in the form of like warrant canaries or failure refusals to comply. But even then, in the in the guidance, it says yeah, but the U.S. probably probably won't hold in the U.S. because the the laws are such that. You know, FISA 702 is, is fairly compelling um, and you can't really say no to it. And, uh, and work canaries are going to be tough to kind of do. Yeah. Yeah, those are interesting, actually, because the, you know, warrant canaries only work for a while, right? They only work until you get dinged. And then once you get dinged, the warrant canary goes away. So the canary's yeah. dead and that's it. But um, but at least for newer companies, you know, I haven't seen it any action by the US government specifically going after the concept of war in canaries. It's would, not would they would they bother though when they could just say don't take down your warrant canary? I don't I don't think that that's happened. I mean I guess they could. Well if if it has happened we wouldn't know. <laughs> this is well, the thing there's a lot of trust involved in warrant canaries. Well, right, but we do know in the sense that Google and Amazon and all those all those companies don't have warrant canaries. Apple doesn't have warrant canaries anymore, right? So ostensibly, you know, they they haven't enforced in those cases. And if I was going to be a, if if I was the devious government, I would be telling them to also throw up their warrant canaries because that's the main. Those are the main companies that are going to get dinged. I mean, your email providers absolutely as well, but you know. In point 48 in the guidance, it says 
contractual and organizational measures alone will generally not overcome access to personal data by public authorities of the, the third country. I think for me, that's the real dinger. Mm. Right. I'm sorry, Ed, I'm sorry, hi folks. I was lurking on the chat and was advised that I could feel free to join the conversation. I was just commenting on the issue of warrant canaries that there is a US First Amendment free speech argument over the idea of the government preventing somebody from removing a warrant canary, arguing that that would be then compelled speech, which would be a violation of the First Amendment. Has it been tested so, in court, though? That's the, that's, see, that's the question that I still don't know the answer to. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, looking at the, 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 the Merrill case with respect to the initial issue of some of the national security letters, I do not right. think that we're going to have necessarily an issue with the US government doing that. The argument being that would we know Probably not, because it might be a FISC, a Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court type peculiar thing, although the FISC is a ex, sort of almost an ex parte unilateral proceedings. But um, my background has to do with some federal legislative policy stuff in Washington. I am a lawyer, and um, I did a lot of work on national security whistleblower stuff. So the Warren Canary thing was an issue that um, I haven't seen challenged in court, and I'm also unaware of companies being told to leave a Warren Canary up. And this type of work that I did, I was the kind of person who would be told by a company, hey, we have a concern about a Warren Canary. Cool. Yay, someone who actually knows what they're talking about. <laughs> Yay. So I imagine there's people in big email providers all over the world having kind of meetings at the moment about whether some kind of divestment would be easier than some kind of novel encryption measure? I've gotten the impression based on the dozen or so webinars that I've been on that everyone is very uh, Pollyanna about this and they're just assuming that they can slap some new language in their standard contractual clauses and pray that mm. the regulators aren't gonna give it, you know, aren't gonna notice. Um, I haven't, I, I maybe, maybe for the big boys, they are spending some time on, I would imagine they're spending more time on the technological aspects because I think that the idea of divestiture, it would be challenging for Google um, or Facebook or any of those other, uh, other, those other entities. Although I think Facebook periodically screams that they're gonna run out of different countries, you know, yeah. every other day. So, but no one, they haven't done it yet, so. You know. Email is probably the easier of the two use cases I talked through at the start of the, the conference as well. It's probably an easier problem to solve, potentially, than infrastructure as a service, because so many com companies are so tightly coupled to Amazon, Google, Azure. And right. uh, have you had that, right? So have you had, is there legal precedence of the US going and succeeding, right? That's server is on AWS or Azure or DigitalOcean and is on that country, I want that data from underneath the, the customer. I mean, yeah, that was, that was the Cloud Act. That was eventually what compelled Microsoft to turn over information on the Irish citizen that, um, that they had, that they wanted information on. But did they, did Microsoft fought it or they they, yeah, they, yeah. So before the Cloud Act existed, and someone feel free to, to correct me because I, I had to do a little bit of research on this, but I am by no means a Cloud Act expert. Um, before the Cloud Act existed in 2018, there was an ongoing dispute between the US and Microsoft to compel information about an individual in Ireland yeah. from an Irish server. And they were going back and forth in court about this. And then Congress just said, yeah, now we'll solve this problem by just creating legislation. And that's what they did. And then based on my reading that the, the, the problem became a moot issue in the court, which means that they had to turn over that information. So we, we the Cloud Act now, because I, yeah, I remember, cause I, you, so, this, so that means that we the Cloud Act, now we have cases, right, of, of one of the providers having to give data in. Oh, I don't know if there's been a separate case yet. Well, that uh, case you talk about is at least one of them, right? If Microsoft has gave the data out, then that's already one. That's one of the cases sorry, that, that has happened. 
So would it be helpful for me to kind of do a quick overview of some of the law that the U.S. uses with respect to try to compel data to be turned over on private citizens? Is that uh, helpful? Absolutely. Yes. Sure. So when you look at U.S. surveillance law, 1978, you have something called FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and that creates the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, or the FISC. Um, in 1986, you have the Stored Communications Act. You also have ECPA, which is the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, which is part of the SCA. Um, moving forward in 1994, you have something called CALEA, which is the Communications Assistance to Law Enforcement Act. In uh, following the September 11th attacks, you have something called the USA Patriot Act. Um, and then in 2008, you have something called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, Amendments Act of 2008, um, which gives us the Section 702. So in the USA Patriot Act, there was a section called 215, which spoke about tangible things, I think was the specific language, though I could be wrong, there's several other cases with peculiar language, which was meant by Jim Sensen Brenner, the congressman from Wisconsin who introduced the legislation to refer to anything that a court would meaningfully compel uh, in a, using a subpoena deuces taken, which is a subpoena for the production of something like documents. This was interpreted by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court to include all, for instance, Verizon, which is a major U.S. telecommunications carrier, all Verizon business metadata records, they said could be tangible objects or tangible things, which is what the Edward Snowden revelations published by Glenn Greenwald of the Guardian in 2013 revealed. So we learned that there is a U.S. domestic surveillance program under Section 215 of the USA Patriot Act. At the same time, we also learned that there is something called Section 702 of the FISA Amendments Act, which was being used in a similar fashion to target non U.S. citizens outside of the United States, which could incidentally collect information on U.S. citizens within the United States. So if you have somebody who is in Paris, who is a target of surveillance, and they are speaking to a U.S. citizen under Section 702 of the FISA Amendments Act, which um, I keep hearing as people say FISA uh, here, and other ways to pronounce it, but um, uh, we say FISA in the States. So anyway, under that authority, they could collect data on foreign data subjects. So that's sort of the universe of U.S. surveillance law in broad strokes. Um, and so one of the things that I see with the Trans 2 decision is kind of shake my head because to my mind, from a normative perspective, the U.S. government is going to compel data to be turned over on the people that it's interested in kind of peering upon, so to speak. So even though there's a lot of garment rending over Schremsu and whether or not data can be put in the United States to be afforded the same protection it would in an EEAA or EU or GDPR style country, it seems to me that the United States via subterfuge, um, multilateral treaties or other types of mutual enforcement treaties are still going to compel data to be disclosed because there is judicial, there are judicial warrants in a lot of these cases, right? That say, we are conducting an investigation, we want you to turn over this information, they give it to a, one of the Five Eyes countries, for instance, and you're not necessarily gonna have one of the Five Eyes say, no, we're not gonna help you cooperate in this investigation. So, I don't know, I don't wanna kind of throw a spanner into all of this, but uh, I'm, I'm a lawyer, not a tech expert, so I'm curious to hear all of your thoughts. Yeah, I, that is really valuable to me. Um, just butting in um, again. I, I think, I don't know whether it's worth mentioning as well that the focus is not so much on whether or not there is a um, surveillance law or a warrant that will allow you to um, get at data for a defined purpose. I think it was more about being able to access an equivalent amount of redress that you could um, access in the EU if the same kind of overreach was experienced, if you had the same kind of thing to complain about. Um, certainly it brought back memories of sitting with guys from the Department of Commerce when Trump was just elected, when I was at my first Brussels privacy conference and um, they were explaining exactly how gnarly the new privacy shield route to redress was full stop for trying to take anybody stateside who didn't do the right thing with your data to to get to any point where you could actually get any joy out of um, get, fixing stuff and um, that's a total aside but yeah it was only to say <laughs> very long-windedly that it was about routes to redress specifically i think i don't think that changes the point about the fact that you're not going to get that um, the chamber of commerce is also a tricky one because there are certain agreements like the Vossener arrangement which sometimes can touch on things like encryption and penetration testing technology. 
where from time to time the U.S. government tries to kind of turn the faucet to a smaller uh, drip with respect to the type of technology that's in the United States that they're allowed allowed to go to other jurisdictions. Uh, but it, it's a so it, uh, anyway. Yeah. It sounds legally like we have to treat cloud environments as even infrastructure as a service environment as completely untrusted environments. And Dennis, this goes back to when we were looking at contact tracing apps, right? Um, we, we have to assume that there are dragons in the environment and the, um, all of the encryption services provided by the cloud provider are untrusted because the cloud provider has the key. So let's, let's say I've got, like, I guess one thing that is okay is if I encrypt data locally and back it up. Right, as long as you're not sharing the key with anyone in the United States or with the, you know, the provider or whoever, and the pro any processing that's done is still done on encrypted information as opposed to unencrypted data. So then right. does this question then turn into actually this is an encryption battle rather than a data transfer battle or a data sovereignty battle? Kind of comes back to the old argument, encryption is king. I think it definitely comes to a technology battle. I think this, like, I think the entirety of, of these decisions or about the Shrums decision and then the follow-up um, guidance is, is lacking in part because they're not really touching on the technological features that could be implemented. Because all of this nonsense about contractual clauses and, you know, doing your due diligence, that's great and grand and stuff, but as, you know, um, and, and, uh, sorry, forgive me, because I just forgot your name, dude. That was really, oh, M uh, Mark, <laughs> sorry. Um, as far as what Mark is talking about, if the U.S. wants it, they'll, they're just going to get it. So I think that, yeah, the technology aspects are going to be the, the touchstone that need to be addressed, um, because it, it is going to be about encryption or about, you know, federated search or any number of other things that, that exist out there as, as mechanisms to do the processing or the um, things locally. There was a little bit of wriggle room as well around pseudonymization. Um, if I'm reading the, I need to read the guidance again because they've been chucking documents out like they're confetti <laughs> in the last couple of days. Um, but it does appear if you will have effectively pseudonymized stuff and the medical trials guys are pleased about this, it's deemed to be adequate supplementary measures for, for SECs. But that's yeah, just the, a bit a bit of an aside. The thing with okay. pseudonymization that bothers me is that people have very, very different opinions about what is considered pseudonymization. Yeah. And some people's opinions are, uh, let's just say, uh, very overly optimistic to what I think effective, the kind of effective pseudonymization that's discussed in that, that, the, that the, the, the drafters of the GDPR were actually envisioning. And it, I think it's kind of how you do it. Because if I have a large amount of data in a big cloud storage system, I then have another piece of software to pseudonymize it. They're both in the same cloud system, probably hosted by US companies, no matter where I put it. So actually, from the perspective of you know, uh, US legislation, it makes no difference because they can go to the original. It makes a difference, yeah, if I'm kind of trading it with commercial companies, I've got a bit of control over how the pseudonymization is then transferred, but actually, where do I do it? Okay, I suppose the bottom line is I could do it on my local hard disk and then upload the pseudonymization, which doesn't kind of really make sense in the, uh, the, the amount of data that would kind of be worthwhile to do. There's no point in me pseudonymizing my kind of family's name and all that kind of stuff, or, or what waste of effort. Um, so I think the concept is great, but I think it's actually probably impractical to do for the purpose of Shrems, that is. Yeah, I think that I think that's fair. I think we're trying to solve large scale material problems with how we've all done business and increasingly been doing business, and which it, it's the question from my point of view has been how much do we defer to a geopolitical bun fight and how much do we try and solve given the complexities and cost of potentially trying to solve this. So can I, can I throw an idea, right? In terms of, because Adam, you know, when, when you talk about, you know, the keys, right? And I think that the challenge here is the whole point of the cloud, right? <laughs> is to delegate processing, right? So, so the idea that, you know, I'm going to bring back processing to the client side, it's almost like <laughs> anti the whole principle, right? Um, but what, what about this, right? At the moment, embassies, right? Are, you know, are locations, right? 
of one country physically located in another country. Oh. Right? <laughs> so if inside the AWS or Digital Oceans or IBM, let's, let's pick IBM because, you know, they want to get into the business and maybe this is competitive advantage for them, right? Or Oracle or whatever wants to come in, right? So let's say that in their data center, there is, you know, a couple of square meters, right? Or a couple of, a couple of things who have now been declared, right? With the same, you know, sort of legal protection, right? As an embassy exists today. Because I'm assuming a leg, there's a legal protection. I don't know, but the lawyers in the room know that. I'm sure, I'm sure there's a legal protection, right? That defines the, the space, the physical space of, of a, an embassy, right? So in your case, for example, of the decryption, so let's say that the email provider is able to split the search, right? The, and, and now this is containers. So this could, let's say, let's, let's put some nice technology on this. Let's say they have a nice containerized, flick the data loads into multiple places so they can move the decryption and the, the processing of unencrypted data and the storage of the keys to those locations, right? Mm -hmm. Who are now governed by local laws, by who own or whatever that is, Thing. Would that solve the problem? Except for the undersea think, cables part? Yeah, probably. <laughs> I think it's the same yeah, as the data be, being right? hosted in, in, in Ireland or, or the EU, right? But there, I think there's Sorry? something you said there about, I think the actual location of the data is not, not that important, as, as we said before. So I don't, no, yeah, the location the of the, the place that there's a decryption. Right, the location of the key. Yeah, if that can be somehow secured away from the, the processor, there might be something in that. But that sounds like a, that sounds like a big step. But yeah, that sounds like a. Potential. It's not just the location of the key. I think it's important, right? I, I think the concept sounds key, good. It's game over. I think the concept right. sounds good. But then, are we then inadvertently handing the keys to our data to our government? No, no, but they already have, right? Now the point here is that they already have the data, right? Like the, the service provider already has the data, right? Right. So you, your email provider, in this case, already has your data, right? The, the question is, how can they create a technological model that doesn't allow, you know, the Cloud Act to basically force that company, which is hosting that email servers in, uh, you know, uh, France or Ireland, right, uh, to give them the data, right? And, and the, the interesting part of this is to, if we can start to decrypt the... Um, you know, the, the, so if we separate the decryption of the data, then which actually is a great principle, by the way, right? It's, it's an amazing security principle because you dramatically reduce the attack surface, right? So I, I love it from a security angle, right? But to the, because Adam, the point here is that it's not just the key, right? Is once you give the key to somebody to decrypt it, they have the freaking key, right? So they, they can make a copy, yeah. right? You know, like, and they have the ownership. Remember that, you know, this, all, all of this is running on VMs on top of containers, right? So the, who's watching the watcher, right? Like, you know, right, there's always a place underneath that will have this like root, right? You know, it's almost like the, the thing that we do now with our phones who have chips, you know, who now have the trusted kind of microchip in principle, right? Who is the only one responsible for encryption, right? So that was a great model, right? Because mm -hmm. they're the ones, they're the only ones who create the hashes. They're the only places that have the decryption key to create the one-way data and stuff like that, right? So, so te technically, right, you know, that could work, right? Because if all of the can we can we draw it? Can we on a threat model? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Can I ask something? Um, just when you decrypt, I mean, in order for you to decrypt the data, you still need there still is a possibility that the data will be unencrypted at one of the cloud systems because you only hold the key, right? But that's easier, that's easier to handle, right? Because I could have a key on my local machine, right? That decrypts it, right? So you, you now can have a way where, for example, with you know, even private, public and private keys, right? That the data in transit is encrypted. Because, and what we're basically saying is that we now mistrust most of the platform. Yeah, so there's, a, there's an online data backup slash file share sync service. Uh, I don't want to mention any brand names, but if you search around for it, you'll be able to find it. That uh, you encrypt the data before it leaves your hard drive. So I use the service for sensitive work where the data is, the backup data, uh, the cloud version of my data is encrypted and only I can decrypt it. Yeah, correct. So it, it, it is like a 
this is, so you're suggesting this in a, in a wider fashion for a wider range of data. Well, look, that's what happens with, you know, with, when, when, when the cloud provider said data is encrypted, right? You know, they made it transparent to you, right? You know, and, and it's cool, right? Like you can make it transparent to them. Like I always felt that there's a massive business to, to be data brokers, right? Or data um, de-anonymizers or the, you know, uh, what's it called? when you make it relevant, right? Like in a way, imagine like if, if, if you have a, an email system that a system that sits between you and your email that scrambles everything or makes it one way data, replaces every from and to, to actually, you know, key and whatever uh, unique IDs that only that intermediary can actually, you know, uh, flip it back to reality, then it doesn't matter. Like the, the data is stored in, in a way that doesn't actually mean anything to those individuals. Right, so to, to the providers and, right, of that system. I think what you're describing, Mark, I bet they don't have a web interface where you can go in and access those files, right? Because they, they don't have the key to show that to you in a web interface. But if we can find a way that the, pro, the actual processing in the clear is processed only in a trusted network, maybe using software from a central location or central software provider, such as one of the big names we've talked about, they also do the storage as well as providing the software but the processing in the clear is done in a trusted location in a compliant way that might enable some of the tools that we're all and convenience that we're all used to having from some of these cloud services to remain compliant with the latest guidance. I mean, I think that the question of processing needs to be better defined because, you know, it, there's in the, even in the data protection guidance that just came out, you know, it's the idea of, of even access, would be prohibited, you know, or it would be made much more challenging in the United States, depending on the, the mechanism of transfer um, and what you're using uh, to get around the adequacy issues. So I don't, I, I, it's not just like um, manipulation of the data. Processing is much larger than just manipulation of the data. It's even something simpler like, you know, if you're, if you're accessing your HR records, just you know, looking at them, um, in the United States, you know, that, um, that uh, ephemeral access could potentially be enough to trigger, you know, these same considerations. At least that's how I've read it, but maybe others have different thoughts. Yeah, but I think, I I think it's important to, to have a, a solution that kind of is technological, you know, realistic, right? Because you know, and, and this is kind of part of the problem with, you know, the, the encryption stuff, right? Like there's no point of somebody coming along and saying, you can encrypt it, you know, you can write an encryption that works only sometimes and I can decrypt it. And everybody goes, well, technically that's not freaking possible, right? That's the point of encryption, right? And then you get stuck in there into that loop of somebody says, oh, you can find somebody really clever to do it, right? Or whatever. It's like, well, that's not how it works, right? So, so I think we, it's important here that we, we have a model that technologically makes sense, right? And, and it, there's a path to it versus you can't use any of those providers, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, until there's a technical solution for this, it's almost like it doesn't matter if the principles are great. If this means that, you know, half of what, how we operate today doesn't work, you know, like David's point, this, if this means that, you know, the, the, the UK, the US cannot provide, you know, Google cannot provide or whatever, the pro pro providers cannot provide those service to, to UK, you know, entities or EU entities, you actually break right the the country right and i remember once seeing a threat modeling and saying you know how dangerous is some of those providers and it's insane right like if some of those providers block access to all the files and and all the emails and all the calendars and actually the cloud providers what's the financial impact and even the society impact today in european countries right i think we have to think right? about it i agree i think we have to think about it as separating layers of the architecture in yeah. a different way to the way we've thought about it before. You have lots of different views of, of system architecture, but you separate out the layer that processes a data in the clear versus the layer that processes encrypted data, and then try and draw some clean lines in between them. That's the sort of technical solution that you could reach. Yeah. And that's kind of how I'm thinking here, right? So if you look at this, right? So, so he's basically saying, so the red here, can you, you guys can see my screen, right? Mm -hmm. So, so the red here is basically is the cloud provider, right? Is your cloud provider, and and the green is the is the embassy. I like the idea. You guys haven't shut it down completely, so I'm going to go with it. 
right? I don't think they should overlap. I think there should be some white space between the green and red. Uh, well, no, because they will be on the same physical location, right? So, and I think that's Maybe. not okay. Realistic, okay. Right. And that's why I was saying, that's why I like the embassy problem, the embassy model, because it takes into account that it is within the land, is within the physical location of that, right? And again, it's, again, it's, it's not realistic, right? Even from, a, again, from a technology point of view, to say that everything has to go to that data center over there, right? I think you'd want segregated perimeter security, but we can come back to that later. All right, yeah, you say it like that. Yeah. Okay, but, but, but I would argue that they're in the same building, right? So, okay, so if you have the crypt and encrypt data here, so this is the interesting thing, right? So, so what you have now is you have the ability, and, and, and this is now very similar to the model, again, that happens inside our phones, right? Or inside, you know, secure ship, chips, right? The, you know, um, you know, for example, search, right? All sorts mm -hmm. of, of data, right? And, you know, so this, so this is basically functionality, right? You know, capabilities, right? Or, uh, so what you have now is, and remember that this is possible already, like, you know, this could be uh, AWS, I don't know how the other guys call it, but this could be whatever the AWS outposts, right? This could be those, you know, those boxes that AWS already has, which is a full blown data center, right? Or, or, or a set of racks. So if you go on your email modes, we, you, so if you have a solution, which is this, right? So if this is the email backend, right? Um, you know, uh, and then this is, let's call it, you know, front end, whatever, you know, or at least, you know, uh, yeah, just UI, right? Whatever we're going to call it, right? So you can actually have a fully functional um, system that works like this, right? You know? There's a couple of constraints. Scales like one is, yeah, go on. One is, one is the metadata. So the, you know, the, who the email's to. But that no, that's all, has, yeah, yeah, okay. Go on. That has to be in the clear at the point of transmission. Yes, but I think I think that's where you need to go specific, right? Because from a email point of view, right, you probably need to draw that line there, right? Because that's the point of an email, right? Because the point of an email today, the whole infrastructure of emails is unencrypted, right? So you know you 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 have to yeah. assume that it's not just that person seeing things; it's everybody on a freaking food chain, right? So That's true. so yeah, you know, like remember that the bottom line here, right, is if you want to watch this, you just put, you know, you just put the the guy, you know, whatever the the the, the watcher guy, you put it here, right? If you and put, the email UI that's hosted in the red zone. But that UI presumably has to be responsive to different lengths of text. Yeah. So okay, uh, so. We have to put okay, the UI in the green zone as well. Okay, yes, correct. So um, so that's the web service, right? Yeah, you're right. So let's call it like this, right? So this will be email UI, right? And, and that's gonna be in the green. Yes. Well, no, the, the email UI runs inside the browser, right? See what I mean? Okay, so, yeah, yeah, no, I suppose you're right, yes. So the email, yeah. and actually this is where it gets interesting, right? Because the email UI is there, let me bring this, right? And now the, the point here, right, is the decryption key, right? And exists only here. Yeah, so that browser in the middle of the red zone can go, right? That's uh, yes, yeah, no, sorry, this was, yeah, I was yeah. gonna put this for data, sorry. I was going to say that. So we've just re we've just reduced the red zone to data storage, basically. Well, we? not necessarily, right? Because you know you, you still need right all of the queues. You need the systems. You need the yeah. scalability. You need the instrumentation. You need the scalability. You need all of that, right? That you know is what makes a backend system to scale, right? So you know the the, the point is who is seeing the content in clear text. Right. Yeah. So if I put my, let's just if it, I assume this works, it seems like a, it seems like it's doable. Um, to build it, right? <laughs> the implementation around this, because you need common auditable standards between every interaction between the green and red zone on every queue, on every every web service, on everything. 
you know, you'd, you'd still be taking the software from the, the uh, untrusted provider. And they could change their software to actually do something different that is not per the architecture. So just the level of technical compliance and verification around this would be huge. Yeah, but, but, but by then, you know, I think that problem will always exist, right? But I think, okay, maybe the law, law guys can, you know, chip in, right? I would say there's a legal distinction here, right? You know, because mm -hmm. remember that this is now a part of the a sovereign, in that particular example, right, uh, of France or Ireland, you could have a contract that says you're not, you're not going to send unencrypted data from one place to the other. Because that's by design is putting a backdoor, right? Right. Right. You, yeah, you could, you could definitely contractually limit that. I think, I think the, the sneaky argument, of course, is that coders could change things if they, they wanted. They can, but, right. it, but if you make it legal, right? You know, yeah, then, legal. I, <laughs> yeah, but the, you have to draw a line somewhere, right? Contractual obligations don't always rise to illegal. They, they rise to, you know, a, a contract violation. So it's a civil matter. Um, but and there's yeah. also a difference between illegal and unlawful. Yeah. Sorry, unlawful. Whatever is bigger one. Go for the big one. <laughs> but the whole well, reason we're something. here doing this diagram is because contracts aren't enough. Right. Well, yes, actually, I just correct. want to raise something here as well that you might want to factor into the calculus, which relates to some discussions I had going back to 2013 on a lot of whistleblower stuff, which is that email metadata is necessary for routing stuff to make sure it gets to where it needs to go. So it's really yeah. difficult, we know, to get through the metadata unless you have some sort of key escrow, which has its own problems, as Matt Blaze showed us in 1990s, in the early 90s. But um, calendar information is often overlooked. And there have been instances where, in the 2008 financial crisis, a law firm recognized that there were going to be significant layoffs because HR had booked all the conference rooms. Yeah. Um, right? So somebody trying to book a conference room saw that all the conference rooms were booked for several days in a row. They realized layoffs were happening. Um, I had, as I mentioned before, doing policy work in Washington, used to do a lot of whistleblower stuff. And so sometimes I would be reluctant to put things in my calendar because if I'm putting in the information, it's not the calendar kind of note that's important. It's the with whom I'm meeting and when that can be important to people who are trying to get that. So then the question and the framework that I kind of hashed was to have kind of this calendar server where data is sent to the server somewhere and then routed to the appropriate person that's disguised so that if we make sure that all emails are at least one megabyte, you know, we can blur it and people can't look and sniff packets or whatever it is the tech people would call it to determine and match something to an email sent because it's a particular size at a particular time and something that exits a secure server at a particular time at a particular size. So if it's like the server's like a pachinko machine and the data comes in, is kind of scrambled and hangs out for a certain period of time and then within the next you know, 10 minutes or so, it spits out the other side. Am I making sense as I'm describing this? Yeah, yeah. the, the yes. data is, is itself something that would need to be protected and, and, and preserved in some way, so. But, but this process could also be something you use where there's something that sits on the outside where the data goes or whatever it is, is sent to this third party thing where something happens. And then at some period later, it's then sent out and routed to the party. So even the parties themselves might not be able to match up. The matching is done somewhere that we put in like a sea land or something. Yeah, and, and I, I think that's, you know, basically what, what, what you're describing, right, is, is that kind of model of, you know, I'm, I'm going to move, right, the sensitive data and the sensitive, sensitive processing over here, right, and I'm, I'm not going to let the main operator to, to extract metadata, right, from that part. And, and I think that's, that's a valuable solution, right? I, I think the challenge with this is in the kind of, real world scenario, right? Um, I think we need to have, a, like the cloud provides a good example, right? we need to have a solution that works and it maintains at least the current level of innovation that you have. If we force, you know, everything to go, right, on, onto separate, even data centers, right, that are handled there, then I, I don't think that will be a realistic solution, right? But I would also add that I, I think we're not talking about the the edge case of of people that really really need to be secure right i, I think i think we need to split that because i would argue that at that level they should be working on much more ephemeral solutions right 
you know, solutions that distribute the load across multiple places. Like you can design and somebody mentioned blockchain and, and stuff like that, right? Just to get that in. I think you can design solutions today that, you know, none of the players have access to that data, right? Like if you want, if you say, I want a solution that, you know, I'm the only one or this small group of people can only have access to, right? You know, I, and I think there's market for it, by the way. I think there's market and it's not just for the elite, you know, whatever. I think there's a whole sector of society that actually should have that, right? The access to those systems. But I don't think that that's what applies here, right? At the moment, this applies to freaking, you know, a huge amount of businesses that are trying to, to, you know, run systems on the cloud environment. Like, in fact, my own, you know, the company I'm working for, right? You know, this applies to us, right? Like, we, one of our services is we, we route, we get emails and we send emails through, right? So we act as a man in the middle of emails being sent to make them safe. So this applies to us, right? You know, has... And I think that's the use case that we need to figure out. Like, you know, do we have a valid solution that allows, you know, even if, you know, you've got those legal requirements so that the companies can do the right thing, which is to say no, right? Yeah, I think the other bit of complexity is it's not totally about keeping the data secure. It's about controlling that data securely. So the people we want to see it, see it, it's kind of easy to keep it secure. We can kind of encrypt it and put it on a USB. That bit's not hard. It's how do we kind of do it and share it to the people and companies who want to share it to in a controlled manner without it kind of getting out of hand. And I think that's that's also where it, you know. It is, but there's a problem. moment where it's a it's to do with the business sort of the the, the, the practices of the application, right? You know, the, the 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 problem. Okay, the problem. The way I see this, the the real situation is that doesn't matter if somebody develops a great software it doesn't matter if they really make it secure right we could design all of this right so that it's end-to-end -end, it's really great there's only the right people have access to the data if somebody can go under the hood right and access our servers access the data at rest access the place where you got the keys and just take it off right in fact change the code right so that's the other thing. So I mean, when you're talking about changing code, the best place to freaking change code is go to the servers directly, right? Like, how do I know that the, the code running on the server is the one that I deployed, right? If you have access yeah, that's right. to the bare metal, right? Yeah, but I mean, the, you would have to have quite a, a, a whole set of controls, even just with code you knew was coming to make sure that that didn't do anything untoward within your green zone. Yeah. But, but this is this this will scale right and in fact you can have independent auditors so so again like look yeah. if, you, if you look at it from a from a complexity point of view right the amount of code here is going to be significantly orders of magnitude lower than here right so if you if you wanted to audit this and to make sure there's no back doors and make sure it has some change control in place it is realistically to say it here versus there right and if this is something I mean, that, that depends on the that does depend heavily on the, the use case, which where the code would be and I think what you were doing with it. But you could definitely come up with controls that you could put in place around things like network monitoring to a degree payload monitoring. But in fact, this is really yeah. Uh, yeah. And actually, there's an interesting requirement. I would argue that this code has to be open sourced, right? Why? Hmm. <laughs> because it should be peer reviewed, right? You should have uh, the open source, you know, uh, and the ability to double check, right? That the, the code here, right, is is still the one that um, you, you want it to run. Because if, if this code is certified, right, if we can certify this code, right? And by the way, these are not simple problems, right? But, you know, but if we want to look at a realistic solution, right? If this code can be certified and can be verified and can be independently analyzed, right, then we can have stronger assurances that as long as that's the code running on that server, right, and knowing that if it's on the embassy space, this company does not have access, physically access to that because it will be unlawful, right, to, to break that. So well, it's not just open source. Sorry, surely Colin. then, sorry, surely then that should also apply to encryption in transit, because that would right. be maybe an, a weaker link that could easily be kind of fixed rather than go to the source. What do you mean encryption? Or the storage. No, 
What about encryption trial? You mean the encryption between here? And yeah, yeah, in, in transit, you know, it's easy to get access to any cables you like, yeah? Right. Yeah, but I'm assuming that... You can swim. Yeah. You just you just need to know how to crack the, the codes between them. The encryption. Sure. But I'm assuming that it's... So my, my, in this design, my, my assumption, right, is that you also... By the way, the, the logic here, just to be clear, right, you also encrypt the data on the way out, right? So So the logic here, right, is that... You get some data, you get an action and do this, right? Let's say, you know, search or whatever, do X to the email, right? Or show me what the latest emails, right? Let's say I go in here and this backend grabs the data, right? Then sends it to, sends the encrypted data, sorry, to, um, to the email backend, which now is going to decrypt those lists of emails, right? And it's going to basically encrypt it again in a way that is usable by the, um, what's it called? Um, the recipient? By the UI. Oh, by the UI, okay. Right, and in fact, probably what will happen here is, is actually this. What you actually have is the email backend will be able to go whatever the emails, well, well, you know, that data is. Yeah, so this is more realistic, right? So the email backend, email backend says, give me all my emails. The email backend too, right, gets that request, goes to the encrypted data, downloads, you know, the list where he knows that answer is, whatever that table is, decrypts it, packages it a little bit, right? Whatever massaging he needs to do, encrypts it again and sends it to the user. So I'm assuming that in the red zone, it's all compromised, right? I'm assuming that, you know, basically this is almost saying this could go in HTTP, right? <laughs> it's like, you know, it could all be clear text because all the data is encrypted in transit until it arrives at the browser, right? And you could have a, a, a you could have a session browser. You can have a Chrome extension. You can have browsers having native support to, mm. for example, going to places to get the keys. So it's transparent to the user, right? It has to be all encrypted in the red zone. I totally agree. And going back yeah. to what you said about open source, Dennis, I'm just thinking, what if it was, and then I could create my own version of the green zone on my own premise or in my own infrastructure. And what if I could, and what if I had a standards based mechanism <laughs> working between the red and the green zone that meant I effectively had data portability between different back end providers? That could be super awesome, but it might be the last straw of the business model for the cloud providers here, I think. <laughs> but but, but it's, it's, it's not because you look more, more and more, right? Like the, the reason why, you know, the, the, we use Gmail versus the other one, or now use Exchange versus Lotus Notes, right? Nothing against, well. I have a couple of things against lots of notes, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I always find that the people that complain about Microsoft, they should use lots of notes for a little bit and then go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. People who <laughs> complain about stuff now really need to go back to the old days. I'm just exactly. like, oh. <laughs> Exactly. But, uh, but the point here, right, it, it won because the functionality was better. I right? like, it, actually, what I like about, you know, even where you were going, Adam, is that the companies should not compete because they have the lock of our data. They should compete because mm. they're better. Right, and as long as they're better, you know, they're more resilient. It goes, it doesn't go down, it doesn't crash. They fast, right, and they provide a good service for us from a UI point of view. We should give them the business. Hey, yeah, I that, makes sense. That, that makes sense. Yeah. I see someone's got their hand up. Can we take yeah, questions, yeah. Dennis? Absolutely. Yeah. Who has a hand up? I want to ask a question anyway. How would that if no one is? It wasn't my hand which was raised up. So, how would that, you know, protecting the meta, metadata in this scenario, Dennis, wouldn't that affect performance here? Well, that's why, you know, competitor A versus competitor B will be better, right? Yeah. But I, I don't think, I think performance, you know, at this level, like this, we, we talk about cloud speed, right? Like you, you have to remember that, you know, the, the best cloud providers, right? It's all containerized from even for decades, right? I remember this story that Google was running 4 billion containers, right? 10 years ago or seven years ago, right? Like the, the, the point is actually into 2020, this is actually easier to do than it was, you know, uh, ages ago, except for the people that have gigantic monoliths, right? <laughs> and they can't move mm -hmm. it out. So ironically, this shouldn't have a huge performance, but, but actually, I think if the data centers are local, that's why, see, I don't know I was saying that if this is not in the same physical location, right, of the data center, then you have a problem because the speeds of data transfer, you know, would never be, right, the same mm -hmm. that you can get inside the same data center. So you kind of need 
this to exist in the same data center for it to be a realistic option. Agreed. Kiara has a hand up. Yep. Hi, thanks for um, letting me ask a question. Dennis, I can tell that you're fired up, but um, I'm not a techie. So I'm trying to re um, uh, focus or reread everything that you're saying in terms of what is the bottom line for Shrems. Whatever technical measure you find, let's say it's encryption, or let's say it's whatever you find, it has to be something that is conditional. Essentially, whatever technical measure accompanies the data going from the EU or the European Economic Area to a third country must be, must be um, obviously meaningful to the um, person it receives it to the uh, target uh, sort of uh, um, receiver. And it must be conditional, meaning that at some point, it must be possible for the authorities, given proportionality, et cetera, et cetera, all the parameters that you know the Court of Justice discusses, to access it. So it's this catch that I think it's always been a pain for encryption that you can't have encryption that's conditional. So I need you to explain if your solution, if your proposal solves this idea that the technical measure makes the data totally inaccessible, but depends. There's a condition. Sometimes it is, sometimes it can be. So could you, could you explain it to a six year old, please? Thank you. So the model that we talked yesterday which was a model where the decryption only happens on the client side, right? Where all the data is encrypted. I think we use the wrong colors here, but all the data is encrypted on the server and is all decrypted on the client computer and then decrypted to see for the user. That we're not allowed to do what you just, you know, describe, right? It would not be possible in some scenarios to access the data, right? So this is, this is like the very binary to say that that is only usable, right? On the client machine, right? The, uh, the problem with this is, I think you would really struggle to work in the real world, right? I think it, this, is, this is really hard to do in a real world. P, that's PGP is what that is. PGP, that's right? Yeah, is it correct? You, you yeah. encrypt the data, you give it over, right? And then from, 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 your, from you onwards, it's just a blob, right? right? But, but I think that's, that's not as realistic. So the, the logic of this is I think this actually will suit your, the way you describe it because, and, and going back to the idea that this is an embassy, right? So the logic here, right, is that let's, let's, let's put this in, right? So this is in the, um, the logic of this is that, you know, this green thing here, oops, is, the, is in the UK, let's say, okay, Ireland, right? So the, England, the green, is in Ireland, and and the red fact is, um, let's say, US, right? US provider, right? Because actually, we, we already established that it doesn't matter where, you know, the, the thing is. What matters is the 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 kind of the laws, right? So so the logic here, right, is we're basically saying that, you know, your data arrives in here, and and the east, this green bit has access to your data. But from a and, and from a Shrem's point of view, the idea is that, you know, even if this is owned, even if the, the the red is owned by a U.S. company, things like the Cloud Act would not apply because the green, I, the place where your data exists in an unencrypted state, is within Ireland's law. And then the case where you say, oh, but sometimes you need to be possible. Well, I would argue argue then it's about this government talking to that government and it, sh and it should be that government that gets the data and then yeah. sends it over. I mean, I think the, the, the Cloud Act would still apply because it's, it's contingent on the company, not necessarily the, the law of the jurisdiction. That's the whole point. And, and say big with if there was a, you know, mutual legal assistance treaty or any kind of additional treaty um, allowing the government to, to compel that data. Yeah, but if the data exists in another jurisdiction, right? Physically, is oh may, may, okay. Let's 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 change this, right? If the, we're saying okay, this is open source, right? Actually, by, and by design, there's no owner, right? So so the reality is that if this is open source, right? This bit here, right? It actually means that this is owned by 
Ireland, right? So, so there's no ownership of this code. But I think, I think it's also, I think it's the cut whether the company is controlled in Ireland or the company is controlled in the US. Otherwise, we're going to have to take over a lot of embassies. Correct. Or solve, <laughs> or solve performance issues across like massive distances. But, but that's, that's an easier problem to solve, right? You, yeah. Maybe you say, maybe this right here needs to be, you know, this, the, the green here, there, there needs to be an open foundation, there needs to be an open mm. a company, a separate legal entity that controls that, right? Mm. So, that Gina, did that, did that answer the question? It, sorry, it sorry. may not do, Dennis. I, okay. Sorry, I, Chiara, I, can I just... I, I was really interested in what you were saying, and I just wanted to replay something and see if I've understood. I, I was thinking similar in that, what's the problem we're actually trying to solve? I mean, the, the problem we're trying to solve is that there's a whole bunch of stuff that looks like we're going to be told to stop doing it because there's surveillance overreach in some third countries. They want mm -hmm. people to rein in grabbing at data and not giving people proper redress when they get it wrong for countries that don't give the adequate protections compared to the EU. Um, if we solve that technically, so nobody can get at the data, even if they've got a justified requirement for it, um, we're just going to make people who use it a target and they'll just make it illegal. Yeah, but, but that, okay, but to a, a solution that, you know, which is this one here, right? So yeah. an email solution where all the data is encrypted, right, in, in the whole environment, that's fine, right? That doesn't matter, right? Because Correct, because everything is protected, right? The, the web server does not have access to the keys, does not have access to the data, right? As long as the encryption is done effectively outside of it. I right? think technically I think Sarah... impossible and, and um, blocking appropriate legal access is so, where the encryption right. backdoor debate is always at anyway. There's, there's necessary tension there. I don't think we're ever gonna fully right. resolve. I don't, if you're blocking- because there's a copy of, there's a key that exists within what used to be the green zone that is controlled by an Irish company in the Irish jurisdiction, then the government can make a lawful request there. Doesn't that provide conditional access? Can I, can I simplify this very, yeah. can I simplify that the bit, the bottom line is that there must be a technical measure that allows Chiara, the sender, to transfer data to Dennis, who is in a third country, in a way that is never accessible to anybody, other than sometimes when a judge says it can be accessible to somebody else. Let's say it's only three, three players in this game. There's Chiara, the sender, Dennis, the receiver, and thirdly, the judge that decides, yes, security services can access it. If the judge says yes, then your technical measure, encryption or whatever it is, must allow uh, somebody other than Dennis Cruz to get uh, to that data, to see or to have meaningful access to that data. If you, if you explain it to me with that simple trilogy, yeah. probably I'll get it. Show me the conditionality that depends on a judge saying, okay, go ahead. Okay. So, I, so, so my, my reading of the situation here, so actually you have two judges here, right? And I think this is important, right? You have uh, a, a judge in the US, right? And, and let, let's, we can use Ireland, right? Because Ireland is, is a good play, right? To, for this, right? So you have a judge in the US and a judge in Ireland, right? So, so what we're saying here, right, is that, and, th and this is, and this is a US company, right? And, and that, let me use the green for now, right? Or maybe I put a yellow in the middle. And this is, so that's a US company. And in, in yellow, you have the Ireland data center, right? So this is, this is in Ireland, right? And uh, so you've got an Ireland data center and you've got, um, you know, a US company, you know, whatever cloud provider, right? So what you're saying is that, you want to send a message, right? So what we basically, 
describing here is you got a message. I'm going to, I'm going to use this again, three things here. So you got encrypted data and unencrypted data uh, flying around, right? On this, right? So you got uh, unencrypted data is within user B, right? So, and, and so we're saying that you're going to send this unencrypted data to this place here. This place actually has, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, this, and, and let's, let's actually assume that this is actually encrypted, right? So I'm actually able to send um, safely the data here. So the data is encrypted. Uh, actually, even in fact, we don't even need that, right? Because I'm thinking, uh, yeah, is encrypted here, right? Let's say we use. Dennis, SSL. I'm I'm wondering if a safety deposit box analogy might make this easier to understand. Well, no, no, let's just use let's use the analogy that she had, right? Because I think. And it works, right? So if you look but, at this, but, but it but isn't part of what we're also kind of doing is how do we subvert other countries' legal systems? Well, yeah. And and if you kind of go back to what's it the 1990s um, about GPS, who was the biggest subverter of encrypted GPS in the US? And it was the Federal Aviation Authority, so they could use it for their planes. So it, it's quite normal to subvert government's uh, encryption. It's not yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So let's assume that encryption is sound, right? We know how to do good encryption, right? You know, it depends on the size of the keys or whatever, right? You know, we're not talking about a breakable encryption, right? So uh, let's assume for this example that encrypted, the data is correctly encrypted, right? So, so what, what we do here? So you've got user B, right? You know, Kiara, and then user A is me, right? User B is me. So Kiara has an unencrypted test um, data with her, right? She's going to use HTTP SSL and so basically going to use TLS to send the data over here to the Ireland data center, to the code inside here. So inside this environment, the data is unencrypted, right? Then the answer goes back and he arrives at me, you know, and I, I can read it, right? And, and I, I put this green here to say is encrypted in transit. So if you're in the middle, you can see it. My understanding, and guys, please correct if I'm wrong, is that this here, would always be possible, which is to say, hey, give me the data in this lawful format, right? A judge in Ireland, in a, for in, within Irish law, what, you know, we will able to say, give me the data in this unencrypted state. For my the key is in Ireland, whereas oh? currently it resides, the key is in Ireland, yeah, yeah. currently it resides with the US email provider. No, 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 the key is in Ireland, yeah, 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 yeah. The keys, all the stuff required to, uh, unlock the whole thing is in Ireland, right? And this look, this applies to your service provider, right? This could be so. This could be about your apply, you know, your your service that you wrote that you publish, right? And is running inside a data center in Ireland. My my understanding is the problem is the judge in the U.S. can go to the U.S. company and say, "You can give me that data." Right. You give me that data and don't tell the user and don't Correct. give the user any right of redress. Yes. That's, that's what Shrems is, is grumpy yeah. about. Right. And I think that's the, the, over, the oversimplification in this diagram is actually a little bit confusing because the US judge would not go to the red zone supporting the Irish provider. It would okay. go to the US provider of the recipient. Yeah, yeah. yeah sorry. May or may not be using a, a similar system. No, no, go to the US company, right? and say, give me the data that is residing in your data center. Yeah, that's what's occurring. Right? And, and, and what we're saying is that we want this and we don't want this, right? So Kiara, the, the, does that, and the, so in your world, right? The, the, the legit judge, right? In the correct jurisdiction, can access the data, can ask for the data, and they will get it. And we don't want this, the point is not to change that, right? You know, that's the current situation, right? That's what will happen with all the email providers. So every email provider today, today can comply to that, right? Carry on, yeah. The problem is at the moment, the judge in the US, right? Or China, right? Or other places, if it's Chinese company, right? Or whatever other companies, right, countries, can go to the company and, again, my reading of the Cloud Act, that the way we describe it, can go to the U.S. company and say, give me that data. 
and you can tell that company that they cannot tell both people in Ireland and the and both users that that just happened. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that that's correct, and, and of course, then the the, the follow on is that as Sarah has mentioned, there's no redress yeah. because the user doesn't know they can't challenge that or they can't challenge it easily. There is a a weird little bit of wiggle room for redress, but it's, it's and, and that's the problem that we're trying to solve here, right? The problem so, we're trying to solve here is. Let me get this right. Are you saying that from a technical point of view, it's never an issue given um, a model of encryption, whatever whatever model of encryption you choose, it's never an issue to um, allow third parties access it, allow only third parties access it, sorry, let me phrase this again, allow only specific and named identified third parties to access it and nobody else. This is what you are telling me. Well, because once, no, once you because... decrypt it, it's in the clear, anybody else can access it. I'll, I'll, do, I'll do you an example. Say the, um, let's say the issue is not really between Irish judge or, <clears throat> or US judge. The issue is that the judge says, okay, decrypt this to let the um, yeah. uh, security services check for uh, terrorist stuff. Yeah. The moment you decrypt it, however, isn't it the case that it becomes available to lots of other people, not just the ah. um, sort of the good security services. It becomes suddenly accessible to Chinese security services. It becomes yeah. accessible to everybody. So yeah. isn't the question, the question is, can the data be decrypted so that it's only revealed to specifically named or specifically authorized people? That's a little bit I'm trying to get. So, so that's technically yes. You know, I, I think you just said, uh, you know, if the people do, you know, accessing, if, if, if judge, in this case, you know, if the judge in Ireland, you know, asks for some cowboys, right, to go and get the data and they have poor security practices and, and, and as soon as they get the decrypted data, they allow that data to be leaked to others, right? You know, that would happen, right? But, but I, I would, today, you know, I, I would say that, you know, we have ways to do that in a secure environment, right? You know, in fact, if anything, you should have secure rooms, you should have, you know, you, you shouldn't be copying unencrypted data and, and moving around, right? But just to be clear, this doesn't introduce a backdoor in yeah. the same way that introducing a backdoor for a UK government would then make it vulnerable to the Chinese government and the US government, etc. Um, it isn't that kind of concept. It is yeah. more, uh, it does have mathematical, um, <laughs> it holds together mathematically. And it even, it might be worth adding a judge in China because yeah. if the email was between someone in Ireland and someone in China, the point of this architecture is there's no way that the US judge could get that email at all. Whereas now they probably could. Yeah, but, but uh, I mean, the user rays in China or one of these users yes. in China. Yes, yes, sorry, I mean a user in, in China. Yeah, because... correct. So if, if, if I'm in China, right, uh, at the moment, I most likely will be able to get that data, right? Hmm. So the judges in, in, who have jurisdiction of the two people who are exchanging the message can access the data. Yeah. But the company that controls yeah. the, the service, the cloud service, cannot. Yes. And just just need to clarify, you know, uh, Chiara, the, the 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 use case where the user A swap keys with user B and data is encrypted in between, right? The judge in Ireland can can do what can can say whatever they, he can. He won't be able to access the data. So, Dennis, just quickly, again, if I'm being stupid, please just tell me if I'm being stupid. How are we solving the problem? How are we making the judge less likely to have? excessive requests and making it less likely that we can put it right if they get sign off to get too much data aren't we just putting a bit more transparency and grit in the machine rather than actually solving the root problem well i would argue that if in this model right where the green is under the legal authority of it's literally you know uh you know what's it called the uh um, the, judge the judge in Ireland in wouldn't Ireland have a say model, in right? in the that data being handed over. So, 
It would. It would. Why? Because in this model, the judge in Ireland can ask for the data, right? Because it's a, you know, it's an Irish company, right? Let's say, right? It's, it's an Irish entity that owns this, right? And that's the same thing. Like, look, a, a country cannot go to an embassy. I, I, I go back to the embassy because I think it's really cool. It cannot go, it cannot walk into another embassy, if, although it's in the same country, right? So is the, I would argue it's the same thing. The US judge in this model should not be able, right, to, to ask for this data to the, from the US company because, you know, it, by proxy, they don't physically have access to it, right? For this company to access this, to get that data would be the equivalent of breaking into an embassy. Okay, so you're solving the extraterritoriality by creating a neutral country version of technology. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, Feel free to find out the solution. It... Right? <laughs> <laughs> but this address is that, right? If you think about it. I think it does. I think it's. A, I think the implementation, as I keep saying, is 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 huge. And I think the the embassy concept. I think we need to think more about that. But I, it is the first possible supplementary measure I've heard of that could retain cloud computing as we know it. There you go, this is recorded. Feel free to send it to whoever, you know. <laughs> and this idea is released in the Creative Commons, right? So there you go, this is our contribution to society. <laughs>
all that goes away. So they get treated just like a regular old country that's not part of the EU anymore. Yeah, and then that embassy, that just give granting embassies as islands of countries within other countries would be situationally dependent on anything the locality imposed on it in terms of threat or risk environment in a, in a whole human rights perspective. But I don't, it wouldn't just get to lift and drop and add a Swissy judgment as a building into a new company new into a new country i'm sounding hesitant because i am because this has blown my mind slightly so i might be talking rubbish but um yeah fascinating trying not to find reasons why not just trying to test the model but look from a from a gdpr point of view right any country you know this territory can be owned by any country that is part of the eu right Yes, but the risk profile doesn't automatically become an EU risk profile just because it belongs to an adequate EU country. Okay, well, hold on, right? If I, if I change this, right, to literally be this, right? And I'm saying that, you know, okay, so instead of this, we, we're looking at this model, right? Actually, going back to what you ask, <laughs> uh, I don't mean to say a while back, right? So if this is, you know, let's say this was technically possible, right? The the email backend, right, calls an open source implementation, right, of email backend two, right, which basically now is hosted, um, you know, by an Irish company, right, in Irish land, right, uh, with, um, you know, in in an Irish data center, right. Now we wouldn't have a problem, right? We basically, there's no way the judge in the US can compel the US company to give you that because they don't physically have access to the data. So, so actually, in a way, uh, this is probably, you know, unless the, the embassy model goes, this is probably the most realistic solution to be legal the way I understand you guys describing it, right? Is you need to move away the ability to access and decrypt the data to a, a location inside, in this case, a GDPR, country and just to add to that the u.s company in the red on the left could be in ireland yeah yeah, well. yeah 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 you're right yes so this is u.s company yeah yes correct they, they could they, they could compel them if they are the controller company and everything that's happening is dictated by them right so there's mean? also the issue that was raised with the uh, American Federal Bureau of Investigation and Apple computers over the iPhone belonging to Saeed Farouk, who was the San Bernardino shooter in December of 2015. You all remember in 2016, Judge Penn in the Magistrate Court in California issued an order that uh, kind of said, Apple, gee, we think this suggestion by the FBI of you creating a custom version of your operating system that can boot the device's RAM and bypass the security features to allow access to the device sounds reasonable. Apple, you have 10 days to tell us why you shouldn't be forced to assist the FBI in getting into the subject device. And you all remember that Tim Cook sent this letter and it was this whole big kerfuffle and the FBI eventually dropped it. But there but is I, a precedent. Yeah, but, okay, but Apple did the clever thing, which is to say we physically can't do it, right? Well, the case was actually dropped because what they didn't say we physically can't do it. They said... This is a major global privacy crisis if we are forced to do this. So that's to do with something called the All Writs Act, which I can get into some other time. But yeah. uh, there's yeah, still think... an issue about whether okay. or not the courts in the U.S. can compel companies to do things, even if they might physically not be able to. They might say, you must create the technology to allow you to do what it is that we want you to do. Yeah. Uh, but I guess in this case, right, if, if this code here is open source, right, then they, they again, physically couldn't do it, right? So it's grit in the machine rather than fixing the legal problem. But sometimes the grit in the machine rewrites the law. So that's why this is fascinating. Yeah, but on, on, on this situation, it doesn't matter what the US just says, right? You know, there is no way to access that data unless you come from a judge in Ireland. No, that's not true, Dennis. How would you get the data? If the American company is the data controller, if they are in control of um, 
why that data is going that way. If, if the business model and the solution is theirs and they've set up how it runs, um, it's, a, it's a legal, they are then responsible for, for, for providing assumes, access to that data. But that assumes that this is dealing with personal data, which they won't know about because it's encrypted. So they potentially cannot be the controller. They can be a service provider, but I'm not sure yeah. they could be defined as a controller as in, they don't in, know what's yeah. there. In this model, the US company does not have access to data. But there is a there is a point to what Sarah is saying in that um, they are they have some level of control over how the data is is treated, which is why I think the open source idea is a really good one, because if yeah. it is open source and people then have control over what they install, having been through necessary controls, mm -hmm. that I'm not sure if it fully mitigates that, but it largely mitigates it from a technical perspective. Yeah, because if you look at this flow, right, the data when it leaves the email UI is encrypted. But there's actually been, um, and I have to look this up, but there's actually been legal debate recently about the fact that if you are creating a conduit for um, data to serve to, to service your business model, it doesn't matter if you can't access it, you are still, um, you've set up the means for this to happen, you've, you've willfully mm -hmm. set up your business model to do this, so it's you, so we come to you to get at that data. If you say it's impossible for you to access it, that then gets into the FBI versus Apple conversation again. Yeah, but if you look at this process, right, uh, in, in this model here, right, the data, even as it flies to the system, is always encrypted, right? So, you know, it's only here, right, in this decryption process, right, that the data becomes green. Yeah, but you, you keep talking about not feasible, to do, I'm talking about within America's rights to ask. No, no, but, but like things they can are ask. separate things. These guys can ask whatever they want, right? Unless the encryption is broken, right? This, this, this US company, even if they control all the source code of the code deployed in Ireland, is not going to be able to access the data. Yeah. Right? It's, 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 it, but look, it's the same way that, you know, now you can say that once you got, you know, the, the chip that has the encrypted private key, right, and everything else relies on that, you know, even, even now you can argue that you could always patch the chip, right, where here, as long as this encryption process between, you know, that, that bit there, right, is, is sound, you know, and, and by the way, now this is how our current encryption works, like this, those, this is PGP, right, you know, this basically, it's PGP and between, you know, um, this is in line with this is in line with the latest guidance. Actually, shit. Sorry, read. this is wrong. Sorry. This is, this is in line wrong. with the latest guidance that we read that talked about if data is always encrypted and is never seen in the clear by the US provider, then that is a sufficient um, supplementary measure. Yep. Yeah, that, I mean, that's it. That it's sufficient supplementary measure to make it OK to carry on doing business with that American provider. It, it doesn't fix the reason why the judgment came down in the first place, which is that there's overreach that you can't seek redress for in the States, but you are mm. mitigating having to stop doing business with someone in the States. You are, you are creating yourself a more secure bubble where you are putting the people who you put through your network at less risk than other, other people's customers. So absolutely from that point of view, yes, I may have been talking at cross purposes. I'm going to shush now because I'd rather, talk too much <laughs> I, I can understand there's an argument the data that how the data is being processed is still being controlled but in all practical to all practical ends the u.s company wouldn't be able to access the data so does, does this model make sense that we're describing here right so with the, the, let me just walk walk through the the sequence of events right so i got an email here ui that i got some data that i can see right so when I submit data, the data is encrypted with the key that I control that I have changed or I got somewhere, you know, from this company, which is located in Ireland. I send the encrypted data to the web service who uses the back end, who basically can store, who stores the data in encrypted state here, right? So the data gets stored in, a, in encrypted. And actually in this case, the data goes to email back end who maybe process it a little bit. And the email backend is the only one that has the ability to encrypt so you can store it here. 
So the only place where the data exists in clear text is inside a company that is an Irish company located in Ireland and in the user's browser, which is whatever he is. The model absolutely makes sense, Dennis. Um, I, I am, it, it is, it is just, we may end up with a chicken and egg that by creating an environment that allows business to be carried on securely um, between us and the states or us and another third country that isn't providing adequate protections, that, that we drive it in the right direction um, because they just have to, you know, they'll stop asking because they can't get at it. Um, so we may right. foil their, ex, their overreach ambitions because of that, which would be fabulous. Um, it, it's uh, at the moment I live in a world where we lead with the law and technology either enables or doesn't rather than technology leading and the law following. Um, and that's not where I used to operate. So this is great to see. Yeah, because I, I think it's important, like when when started this conversation, right, there was almost like, uh, uh, Oh, so there, there's no way that this would even you know work in practice right because you know and i think this is already a massive push i, I feel that this is going to be really hard where i think if you can have a way to create a safe heaven haven sorry where it's not possible for the u.s judge to to go to the company and the host and say give me the data without coming to the judge in ireland i could see that working right and i and that you, you can contra expectations and with the laws, right? Yes. Right, I think Dida has a good point. I think it's an hour and 50 minutes into this. I think, <laughs> uh, we, okay, we didn't do any labels, but I think we come up with a really cool solution, or at least one solution, right? Not for uh, my emails, for this. not a short term any, one. <laughs> any final comments? Oh yeah, no, you don't have a solution for emails. Excellent, yeah, thanks a lot, Dennis. People need to figure this out, right? Really good, Dennis. Thanks. Cool. Any final comments? Yeah, really good. I, I do think there's a proposed architecture here that I think we need to think of a name of. Um, I'm not sure how, how it would work in terms of business models, but technically it hang, and legally, I think it hangs together. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess we'll see what happens. <laughs> cool. Anybody else? It was a great discussion. Everyone uh, pushed in. Thank you all so much. So well, actually, while you're here, what will be the topics for next month, right? Should we just continue a variation of this? Trends 3. We might as well predict it. Uh, Trends 3. I think it would be really cool if you guys, you know, for, for you know, some of you who have, you know, to bring a couple more people, right? It would be really cool, for example, to pick a couple of these solutions and, and bring a couple of more people who are more deeply involved into this. And I guess the, the, you know, we got the recording, right? So, you know, feel free to, to share the recording, you know, we'll publish on the website, maybe create a short version of 10 minutes that, you know, I have the highlights, but uh, I think it'd be good to try to get more people involved and get their opinion, right? In fact, get somebody from an email provider, right? That can actually say, you know, what's going on on their end, right? That'd be very cool. So please send the invites. So yeah, so a month from now, right? Sec first, second week of December, let's do part three of this. Or part Ooh. two. Right. Well, thanks everybody. It's been, been a long- Thank you. Actually really cool. I better, you know, the, the, the notice the time passing. So I guess that's, that's a good thing. So, and this is the end of our week on the Open Security Summit in November. And I'll see you next month.